Okay, so what this suggests then is that many of these chronic illnesses, like Alzheimer's, are really signaling imbalances. I mentioned osteoporosis. You outstrip for years the osteoblastic activity with the osteoclastic activity. Cancer, same idea, but now because of typically somatic mutations, you have more cytoblastic activity. You are making and keeping more cells than turning over the cells, cytoclastic activity, and you develop what's called cancer. What we found in the laboratory is that the same sort of thing happens with Alzheimer's disease. There's a whole set of signals that are synaptoblastic and they have to do with your trophic activity and your nutrition and your lack of inflammation and your energetics. On the other hand, there's a whole set of things that are synaptoclastic and that has to do with inflammation and poor support and toxins and things like that. And when there is a mismatch between these four years, you end up with Alzheimer's disease. So we can look at this as a network insufficiency. So you have these different subsystems within your brain, and one of them is very important for plasticity, so neuroplasticity. And this particular, particular system has, as I mentioned, a whole set of things that are synaptoblastic, a whole set of things that are synaptoclastic. So your probability of getting Alzheimer's, which is what I'm expressing here, probability of getting Alzheimer's is proportional to the integration over time, what happens to you when you sum up all the different things that are synaptoclastic that are pulling back and then oh, divided by all the different things that are growing forward, the synaptoblastic signaling. So when we want to treat people, we want to identify those, we want to reduce the synaptoclastic signaling, we want to increase the synaptoblastic signaling. Okay, so what are those things? Well, they're approximately equal to four major groups. So anything that is an inflammatory mediator, and I mentioned NF-kappa B earlier, but whether you've got infections in the brain, whether you've got leaky gut, whether you've got systemic inflammation, all of these things uh, are critical. These increase risk for cognitive decline. Then in addition to that, various toxins. So then there again, there are many things that contribute to that. They come in three general groups. So it's the, the inorganic ones like mercury and um, people here in California who, uh, who, who were in the California fires, increased risk for cognitive decline. Um, the, the people who were actually the first responders, unfortunately, with the World Trade Center, uh, by 2015, 13% of them already had suffered cognitive decline. So anything that increases toxic exposure, so things like uh, mercury and, and inhaled, uh, 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 anything you know, near a freeway, air pollution. Secondly, organics. Again, as I mentioned, things like benzene, toluene, formaldehyde, glyphosate, all of these things that contribute to toxicity. And then the third group, the biotoxins, things like trichothecenes, ochratoxin A, gliotoxin, all of these things are potential risk factors. On the other hand, on the denominator, you're looking at things that decrease it and things that if they're too low, you're increasing your risk for all times. So energetics, absolutely crucial. When someone is beginning in that pathway toward Alzheimer's, virtually everyone is reduced in their energetic support for the brain. And you can see this. If you simply look at a PET scan, you see decreased utilization of glucose in the temporal and parietal regions, which is one of the reasons that we're so supportive of the idea of ketosis as one of the, you know, one of the many things that is helpful for treatment. So for energetics, we think of four major uh, categories. So one, we wanna have enough cerebral blood flow. So people have gotta have the vascular support there. This is why exercise can be very helpful. Secondly, they have to have enough oxygen. So many people do not realize they are dropping their oxygenation at night when they are sleeping, whether it's from sleep apnea, whether it's from upper airway resistance syndrome or other things. Good idea for everyone to check your nocturnal oximetry and certainly all the patients that are, that are complaining of cognitive decline or interested in reducing their risk. The third thing is then ketones. You have to have combustible substrates. And for most of us, we've been using glucose too much and we're not metabolically flexible. We need to have that metabolic flexibility so we can burn ketones, we can burn glucose and we can go back and forth. So we have enough energetic support for this amazing synaptic network. You have over 500 trillion synapses in your in this wonderful brain of yours. 
So very helpful to have a combustible substrate. And then the fourth thing is, of course, mitochondrial function. You've got to have mitochondria to burn these to get the effect. You've got to get the energy. So basically, you have to, you have to move the substrates up there. You've got to have the blood flow. You've got to have the oxygenation that helps you to burn it. You've got to have the mitochondria functioning. and You've got to have the ketones to burn. And then finally, trophic support. And this, again, three sorts of things. It's growth factors, nerve growth factor, BDNF, uh, things like that. And then the second thing is hormones, estradiol, progesterone, uh, pregnenolone, testosterone, DHEA, all of these things are critical to support synapses. And then thirdly, it's nutrients, uh, B12, vitamin D, things like this that are absolutely critical. Choline, one of the most common ones where many of us are, are, have reduced and are, are insufficient in the amount of choline that we take in a day. We should be getting about 550 milligrams of choline per day. And most of us are more like 350 or 400 uh, if you look at it. So that's, this is what tells you what Alzheimer's is, what contributes to it, how you get it, and what to do about it. <music>